All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for our webinar, Agile Best Practices with the Atlassian Toolset. Um, we're going to go ahead and record this webinar and then submit a link to the recording over the next couple of days. So just a note, our next webinar is scheduled for July 2nd at 11 a.m. Central. Um, this webinar will be focusing on a new enterprise offering from Atlassian. Um, it's a surprise webinar. Um, we're not allowed to release any of the details yet, but um, more information should be coming in the next couple of weeks. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and provide them via the questions utility and the GoToWebinar control panel. I'll make sure to queue them up and then we'll go ahead and answer them towards the end of the session. So on the phone today from Precipio Consulting, we have Amanda Babb. Amanda is a senior solutions architect here at Precipio Consulting, a certified scrum master, and has extensive experience in implementing agile methodologies with the Atlassian toolset. My name is Shayla Sander. I head up business development for Precipio Consulting, and I'm going to be your, your moderator for this webinar. So we've been Atlassian experts for over five years now, and we're one of five platinum enterprise experts in the country. Over 99% of our projects are Atlassian related, and we have over 100 clients across the U.S., ranging in size from 20-person companies to Fortune 10 enterprises across many different in industries. We help our clients with process-centric technology solutions that facilitate traditional business process management, IT service management based on idle, and software development life cycles. Whatever widgets you produce, we help improve the quality and throughput at the lowest cost. So we support our clients in all facets of the Atlassian product suite and build methodologies and solutions across the entire line of products. So that includes licensing, solutions architecting and implementations, installs, upgrades, and maintenance, hosting and managed services, and training. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Amanda to take us through the webinar. Excellent. Thank you, Shayla. Appreciate that warm and fabulous uh, introduction. <laughs> All right. So what we're going to cover today <clears throat> is being agile, some of the pitfalls of new agile adoption or some of the, the pitfalls that people have been uh, experiencing recently with agile adoption, embracing change, integrating change and release management into an agile framework um, on top of just your uh, development teams as well, and then failing fast. Um, one of the big things about uh, Agile frameworks is the ability to check and adjust as necessary every single day, remove blockers. Uh, so we're going to talk about um, some of the dev tools and how they work with Jira, Jira Agile, and more specifically, um, how you can feature branch immediately from those things. So the first piece we're going to talk about is being Agile and some of the pitfalls of that early Agile adoption. Now, I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to attend our webinar in February regarding Scrum concepts and roles, but it's something that we do need to um, kind of briefly address. We're also going to talk about velocity reporting and how that can help you through sort of the painstaking process of early adoption. And then um, sort of a hot topic within Agile in general is Agile resource planning. It's a question that comes up every single webinar uh, about how to manage Agile, but also manage um, hours and resources that are devoted to any of your Agile development projects or any of your Agile framework uh, business processes. So just real brief, not going to bore you guys with all the, the nitty gritty details about Scrum, um, but there's some information that's out there at scrumalliance.org. Uh, that's actually who is uh, giving me my certification to be a certified Scrum Master. Um, but essentially, whatever version of Agile you've talked about or how long you've, you've known about Agile, really sort of the, the turning point in the frameworks themselves came with the concept of the, or the introduction of the Agile Manifesto. Um, if you're not familiar with the Agile Manifesto, we talk about working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan, um, and individuals and interactions over, over processes and tools. Um, so 
for the most part, from an Agile framework perspective, I'm most familiar with Scrum because I am a CSM, so that's kind of what we're going to focus on uh, throughout the, the course of the presentation today. All right, you've got your product owner, um, who's really there responsible for gathering requirements. They're the ones that meet with the stakeholders. They help determine some of the acceptance criteria with the stakeholders. But the most important thing to remember about them is that they are sort of the single ringable neck, right? They're the ones that actually also have the ability to stand up to the stakeholders and say, no. Then you have your scrum team. And your scrum team are the, are the folks that are actually there to do the um, hardcore development, really make your commitments at the end of each iteration, at the end of each sprint. This is what we're going to commit to getting done. Uh, they're responsible for estimating the effort that it's going to take in order to deliver that, those potentially shippable units of products. They're also the ones that do the development and testing, right? And then the last piece, you've got a Scrum Master. Um, and really what they're, they're there for is mostly facilitation, but they also do things like remove blockers for the Scrum team to make sure that they can get, um, that they can honor the commitment that they've made. Uh, they run interference if need be um, to kind of keep uh, any of the stakeholders out of the Scrum team's hair. Uh, they also are, are the facilitator of all of the meetings involved in Scrum because if, you've, if you're familiar with the framework, you know there's lots and lots of meetings. Um, so they help move that around um, and make sure that, that people are cognizant of the time boxes associated with those particular things. So kind of one of the jokes about um, in in Scrum in general is we talk about chickens and pigs, right? Where a chicken walks up to a pig and says, hey, I was thinking about opening a restaurant. The chicken says, or the pig says, cool. The chicken says, how about ham and eggs? And the pig says, no, nope, I'd be committed, but you'd only be involved. And so um, to kind of think about it just sort of as a joking way to kind of dig it into your head, um, your, your pigs are really sort of your Scrum team. They're the ones that are making the full commitment to the potentially shippable units of product after each iteration. Um, and your chickens really are, are a combination of your product owner and your stakeholders that are coming and saying, hey, I'd like to be involved in this, but I'm not actually doing the heavy lifting. Basically, the whole concept of Scrum right here in a nutshell is do what you say you're going to do when you said you were going to do it, honor that commitment during those iterations. So when we start as an early adopter of Agile, um, one of the pinnacle things of the framework itself, the Scrum framework, is, is the concept of trust, right? The other main concept of it is sort of the definition of cadence. Um, There's actually a client of mine that brought up that word to me to try and help um, define velocity when I was kind of coaching him through what Agile is. Um, and early adopters of Agile have to be patient to allow that Scrum team to develop their cadence to allow them to get into a lockstep. And the way that we can go ahead and, and look at this and sort of monitor this in the beginning of an Agile adoption is through the use of velocity reports. So this is an example actually out of Jira Agile of a velocity uh, report from a Scrum team. This particular Scrum team actually estimates in story points, right, because they use relative estimation um, instead of hours to determine how what how big or small the effort is for them to honor their commitment to have that potentially shippable piece of product. So you'll see that over time, because typically it takes between three and five sprints for a team to develop their cadence or understand how well they can estimate and meet their commitments, you'll see that over time we have sort of these wild swings in the beginning, right? Well, as they get better and better, um, it's kind of like a Taylor series in calculus. If you go a long enough timeline out over the, the x-axis, eventually your uh, variation uh, above and below that x-axis will actually tailor up or taper out to zero. Same kind of thing with velocity reports. As we're looking at these velocity reports, you'll see wild swings in the beginning um, of saying, well, you said you were going to finish these user stories, but you didn't. That's okay. As long as the team is, is gelling and learning and getting to the point where they understand um, how to estimate what their level of effort is and then be able to meet their commitments, you just have to trust that that will happen. So the last piece we're going to talk about in this section is, is really sort of the concept of Agile resource planning, right? Every time we do something that has to do with Agile, uh, whether it's a webinar or an implementation or a demonstration or whatever, we always get the question of somebody saying, hey, 
how can you use Jira Agile to look at resource planning in terms of how long we think we're actually going to, to take on this effort or these chunks of efforts and things like that. Um, and there's, there's sort of the purest mode, which is typically the way that we answer, which is relative estimation, the use of story points or t-shirt sizes or things is really truly what the pure agile frameworks are supposed to use. Um, from a psychology perspective, our brains are really horrible at saying, oh yeah, that's two hours because inevitably we'll end up spending more time, maybe we'll get interrupted, et cetera, et cetera. But our brain can, can look at two different objects, say a big tree and a little tree, and we can go, oh, well that's a bigger tree than that one, so that one must meet, need more water, nutrients from the soil, food, what sunshine, et cetera, in order to maintain it being a big tree. Right? So we have that, that, that very easy thing in our brains that we can do relative estimation. But when we look at hours, we kind of go, e. In any event, because it's something that everybody's always very um, curious about and want to make sure that, that there is the ability to look at hours and resources and things like that, is that there's been a, a slight change to the most recent version of Jira Agile, where here, not only can you set up your boards to have an estimate estimation statistic of story points, but you can also start looking at things like issue counts, resource days, um, those kinds of items so that you can actually look at um, what kind of hours you're spending on those agile efforts, right? Because at, at the end of the day, somebody's got to sign the check and somebody's got to need, need to know where all those hours are going. Um, you also are able to enable time tracking on your boards themselves so you can look at what your remaining estimates are versus your time spent on the individual stories and things like that. So there's there's been um, a lot of discussion around this and I think it's, it's later on when I demonstrate this I'll be able to show you a little bit from a burn perspective what you'd be looking at in an iteration or an overall project depending on what business process you're using um, that you're applying the Agile framework to. So our next section that we're going to talk about is embracing change, right? So when we think about an Agile framework, most people think SDLC. It's only in the SDLC space, only in the actual development space. Well, the fun part about Agile is because it is a flexible framework is that you can apply it to lots of different business processes. In this particular case, what we're going to discuss is how we can apply Agile frameworks to change management and release management and then also discuss just very briefly some other processes, other business processes that you can manage with an Agile framework. So from a change management perspective, when you've got a whole bunch of changes coming at you on a regular basis, whether they're feature changes, right, or project changes or things like that, typically what we encourage people to do or our clients to do is go ahead and in, implement some sort of funnel type thing and we usually call it something like a change control board, right? So we have these, these rich set of, of items that uh, stakeholders are submitting on a regular basis, whether they're new feature requests or bugs or maybe they're doing project changes or maybe it's it could be any number of things, an enhancement, right? So at some point in time, you have all of these things coming at you and you need to make a decision as to what has the priority, what are you going to attack in the next iteration, whether you call that a sprint or it's time boxed into a typical sprint time box of a couple of weeks. Um, and then who's going to help facilitate that communication, right? So if you think about it, all of these things that are coming at you on a regular basis can be managed by a product owner who can then groom the backlog of all of these new features and enhancements and requests and changes and bugs um, and set the prioritization for your, um, your actual change control board, which ends up being your scrum team, to go and do research on and either develop user stories out of them for new pieces of development to hand over to the developers or possibly saying, you know what, this actually is a much larger change effort than we thought, so let's go ahead and develop some more um, discovery or scoping around it. Let's go ahead and create an epic that we can go ahead and, and start breaking down into individual user stories to hand off to your development team. And of course, your Scrum Master is there to help facilitate those conversations. So it's a very 
a flexible framework, again, that you can wrap around your change management processes. You also have the ability to wrap um, an Agile framework around release management. Because the whole concept of Agile development is the potentially shippable product does not necessarily mean that all things are going to be shipped or merged into that golden code. And this is where we start talking a little bit about Stash and working with Git and the Git flow workflow, right? So to a certain extent, we've got your, your master, your golden code, right? Things that you would actually release out into the big bad world, out to your customers, out to your general public. You have a release branch, which is really the ones that, um, based on what you have in your development branches, you make a business decision to feed any sort of development up into your release branch to be vetted and tested before you make the business decision to move it up into the master or the golden code. Um, in your development branch, right, you also have your, your feature branches that you can say, okay, let me go ahead and make a pull request, let me pull down the code, let me do some additional development against it, let me see if, if what I'm doing is going to break or fulfill the request, et cetera, et cetera, before you then merge that back up. Spend a little bit more time in depth with that. But really the most important piece here is the ability to make a business decision from that release branch as to whether or not you're going to pull all of your units of development, your backlog, that's been groomed by a product owner, um, reviewed by a release team up into your master code, right? So again, we can apply a Scrum framework around release management um, as a business process, right? So the fun part about the Agile mindset is to make sure that you're thinking about what is possible, right? Not necessarily what's, what's strict or rigid, but what's possible, and then decide whether or not to actually do something based on cost or relative value. And that's how this fits in from a release management piece, is you have the ability to go ahead and assess and work on things, uh, groom your backlog, prioritize your backlog, say that these are going to be the items that we're gonna spend the time on, go for it, and then merge it up into your golden product. And then sort of the last piece that we're going to talk about in this section is where else can you apply Agile? What are some of the other places from a concept perspective that you can apply a Scrum framework or any Agile frameworks? So we talked about change management, how we would talk about a something like a change control board, like uh, you've got a product owner that grooms your backlog of all of your changes, prioritizes your changes, your uh, control board will go actually in and, and act as your scrum team to do any additional research and scoping is necessary, and of course your scrum master goes and uh, helps facilitate or remove blockers as needed. Talked a little bit about release management, same kind of thing. Uh, for those of you that are not in the tech industries, uh, you may be f more familiar with something that's um, like a corrective action review board. Uh, some of the time that I've spent in the electric utility business, this is a pretty common thing where somebody will uh, flag a, a potential safety issue or something that needs to be changed and what will happen is all these uh, again changes or issues will come into this group to go ahead look at them uh, and then decide what's going to go into the schedule for maintenance for one of the plants. So here you have somebody that gets them as a product owner, prioritizes all the corrective actions, uh, the group goes out and does the, the inspections and actually looks at particular valves or um, different issues that have been brought up to the Corrective Action Review Board. They provide some additional background around them, and then from there we decide on what's actually going to be scheduled for maintenance going forward. Right? Again, it's flexible enough that you can apply it to any business process. Similar thing with customer order cycles. You have a whole bunch of customer order, orders coming at you at any given time. You go in, create a backlog, prioritize your backlog, set people to work on what they can commit to in very short iterative cycles, then release that out into, uh, into those customers, whatever product that they've, they've asked or requested. 
business development is another way that we can do this. I know I'm talking a lot about it and reiterating and reiterating and reiterating, but it's just one of those where I really want you guys to understand that there's lots of flexibility in the Agile frameworks and you can apply it to pretty much any business process in your organization. Sort of the last section we're going to talk about before we get into a little bit of a demonstration is the concept, the agile concept, of going back a little bit in the SDLC space of failing fast um, and talking about feature branching with Jira and Jira Agile. So if we bring up this diagram again, this is a Git flow workflow. Um, this depends on Sash working with, uh, or any of your code repositories working directly with Jira or um, any of the Atlassian pieces tool set is you have this concept of feature branching, right? You need to know how to course correct relatively quickly. You need to be able to release on a quick time basis to your general public. Um, you can attack features that may not ever be merged up into the development code or not necessarily, if it's not merged up in development, then it's not a release candidate, right? So from JIRA itself and from some of the other pieces like Stash and uh, Bitbucket, you have the ability to create a feature branch, go and do your development pieces, merge it back into your development code, which ends up being sort of your messy code, um, and see whether or not it works. And if it fails, you get almost immediate feedback. You haven't touched your production code. You've maintained um, isolation on that. Um, and you get almost immediate feedback. The other great feature about it is, is that merges are almost painless, right? It's a single button. Uh, before, when you were trying to merge up into a development or a release or a master branch, you ended up having to go almost look at line by line what was going on, make sure that all your commas were in the right place. Like, it was excruciatingly painful, and that's why releases didn't happen very often uh, because it was just you had to dedicate somebody to sit there and and, and look at your change sets and things like that. Now you can merge it with a single button push and see if there's going to be any conflicts or issues or problems, right? The great part about it is that Jira is now your single point of truth for all of these efforts, right? So this is actually a user story and in this particular user story it's been deployed to production. Um, but you'll see all of your branching commits, pull requests, reviews, and builds directly in JIRA. You may not perform your work in JIRA, but at least it's all there so that you can see everything that's going on with your Agile team at any given time. And they're also receiving the immediate feedback to be able to, moving forward, better honor their commitments during their iterations as well as going forward being able to gauge better what their estimates are in order to complete the chunks of user stories and such that they've committed to during that iteration. So with Jira and Sash, essentially it's super simple. You branch, uh, you start developing against it, you pull it up and you start discussing about things. You can approve code changes right there, um, anything that's related to the pull request, and then very simply merge that code back in. It's no longer this excruciatingly painful process of going and trying to match one for one on your master code. And then here, with Jira Stash and Jira Agile, you again see you have your development panel down on the lower right hand side to tell you about your branches, commits, pulls, requests, and builds, whether or not it's been deployed. You have a very quick, easy view of your board to tell you what's to do versus what's in progress so that you can honor your commitments. You can see everything um, that you need to see as an Agile developer all in one place. You don't have to go to five or six or eight or 12 different places anymore. It's all in a single point of truth in a single Jira ticket. So now that we've talked a lot about all of this lovely stuff here, I'm going to go ahead and provide a brief demonstration about some of these concepts and how we can, we can work with applying an Agile framework specifically to like a change management uh, framework and a release management uh, business process, I should say. All right. 
So here we are in our demo instance. And let's say that I'm ready to go ahead and create a brand new board for my change control board. In this particular instance, I'm creating a, a Scrum board. I'm going to create a board from an, at, uh, an existing project, something that we already have that's out there. Maybe this is where your uh, Jira service desk feeds into your um, one of your request projects, you know, people requesting new features, new enhancements, things like that, right? So I'm going to create this board from an existing project. And we're going to name it Control Change. There we go. <laughs> Control Board. Scrum Board. And we're going to look for, there we go. And we're going to look for our, our project in, in which people are submitting uh, feature requests, enhancements, etc. So voila. I'm going to go ahead and create my board. We're going to give it a sec. And we always love when we see these little success things here from uh, from Jira in general. Tails says, "Yay, you've been successful! You did what you said you were going to do." All right, let me actually make that a little bit bigger. All right. So as a change control board, I may be looking at uh, different features and different feature requests coming in at any given time. You'll notice that there's actually a lot of items that are in this um, particular backlog. These are three particular features that, that uh, people have requested. These are things that maybe I'm ready to attack. Uh, I may be looking at the rest of this and saying, eh, you know, it's okay. Uh, it's really not that important. Wait, no, I've got something that's flagged up here. Uh, I want to go ahead and put that flagged one because I'm going to want to bring that. I'm also going to want to attack these particular features. So through the backlog grooming process, the product owner or whoever the head is of this change control board is able to move these features around and say, okay, these are the things that we really want to go ahead and attack on the next iteration for our potentially shippable product out to our, um, out to our general public. These are the things that we want to concentrate on. And I apologize if I'm giving anybody seizures by scrolling up and down a lot. So we've groomed our backlog. We've decided that, that really this is the order of priorities that we need to work on. Uh, we put our flagged or uh, issue as the first, as one of the first things that we think is, is important from a priority standpoint. We're getting ready to go ahead and, and talk about what we're going to commit to in terms of doing research and seeing if these are the things that we're going to develop. We're going to cl click create sprint and drag this bad boy down. And these are the things that we're going to go research and work on and, and talk about and make some sort of commitment on over the next couple of weeks for whatever our sprint is. So we're going to go ahead and start our sprint. Maybe we can make faster decisions. So we're actually going to do a start sprint. Now you'll notice this, that it will automatically tell you if you have an error, which is pretty awesome. So if you're not estimating ahead of time when you're creating your sprints, it will treat it as scope change. Basically what that means is when you're looking at a burn down graph at any given time, uh, you'll see instead of doing this nice little steady drop as you're getting towards the end of your sprint, you'll actually see upticks or huge spikes, right? So in that particular case, if you see something like this is a little warning, oh gosh, I forgot to add my estimates. Well, let me go ahead and add those in. So under our estimates, this one's set up to be story points. So we're pretty, we're pretty confident that we know how to do a lot of these things, and we've been working together as a change control board for a while, so... Um, we know that we can knock actually a lot of these things out in terms of how long it's going to take us to, to do the research and gather some of those additional requirements before we hand them down. 
So we're actually committing to 46 story points for this particular sprint. I'm going to go ahead and start it. We're super quick, so we can do five-minute sprints. It gives me a little bit of basic information. Awesome. And so as we do our research and we think um, we've come through and, and started to really gather the requirements around these pieces, uh, we can go ahead and move these across the board um, as done or in progress. We're going to close that one. And maybe we actually overcommitted, just as an example. So we're actually going to leave this one in the in progress. And we're going to update our parent on this one too. Sorry. All right. And we're going to go ahead and close out our sprint as the change control board. Now we've got something here that we just did not have time to research or whatever. Um, so it's incomplete, so it's going to be, it's going to land at the top of the backlog. Pretty awesome. That way we can go ahead, whenever we meet up next, we can go ahead and um, look at that issue again and do our research and see what we need to do from a requirement standpoint to then start handing those off to the product owner and the scrum team that's actually going to do the development. One of the cool things about um, when you have Jira and Confluence linked, just sort of as an aside, is that as soon as you get to the report phase, it automatically asks you whether or not you'd like to create a retrospective in Confluence. So you can actually have your retrospectives in Confluence immediately. Um, that's helpful for any of these groups or any of these business processes uh, where you can look back and say, this is why we failed, right? Or this is why we didn't meet our commitment. Not a failure, we just didn't meet our commitment. So if we look more hardcore at our burn down chart, you'll see here we're actually able to burn these down. We still missed one, um, and it'll give us some, some basic details, right? Again, a lot of this information is actually covered in our um, Jira Agile Primer webinar uh, from February. Um, so feel free to, to, to watch that to look more in depth at how the reporting works for you. So in this board itself, right, we've looked at how it's handling the estimates, and this one in particular is handling story points. Well, one of the things that I had talked about before was the ability to uh, work with something uh, from an hour's perspective or time estimates perspective. So we're going to actually change this up a little bit and configure this to work with hours. So here, under our estimation menu, on our left-hand side, this is where we get to whether or not we can do estimation and um, time tracking, right? So before, as in the slide deck, we had the story points and all of these different pieces. We can look at this from a resource days perspective, um, all of the things that it takes us in order to do that. And you'll notice that it says your velocity from sprint to sprint will be measured against these estimates of resource days. I can also select remaining estimate and time spent, and I can track time against issues using those fields um, in the different issues themselves. So here I'm able to, to kind of work around uh, how many hours it's going to take in order to fulfill a particular request. Uh, again, that's not pure agile, but we always understand that there's got to be somebody at the end of the day that strokes the check to pay everybody, and they want to know how those hours are translating into dollars, right? <laughs> so if we go back to our reports, you'll notice how this changed, right? Our guideline because we didn't have any time estimates in any of our user stories or anything like that. Basically, it's, it's flattened out over this period of time and said, we didn't have any time estimates, so you're not going to get a burn down. Same thing in our sprint report. We see this nice flat line, which is basically a combination of your burn down as well as a little bit of detail about what was completed versus not completed. 
if we look at our velocity, ah, it's all blank. What happened? Again, same thing. Because we did not have our estimates laid in there as resource days, then we are unable to burn down or track velocity based on what was completed by our teams, whether that's in the change control board, our development teams, release management team, whatever that is, right? So it becomes extremely important when you first get ready to click the little agile thing and, and uh, create your first board is you have to know, you have to gather some information around how either you or clients in general are going to configure their boards, right? Because they have to be able to put in those estimations in the beginning to be able to burn down resource days at resource time. So change control board, we talked a little bit about. Let's go ahead and talk about a oops, sorry. Release management board. Okay. And this is probably, release management is typically a separate JIRA project than you would actually have your development board or your uh, change control board, your change management uh, project in. Okay. And from here, it becomes important because of, um, because of the way that JIRA and JIRA Agile handle releases, it becomes important that we understand what the versions are, right? This is how JIRA handles releases, is through versions on the issues themselves, right? So at this point, I may not want to look at the overall epics because to a certain extent, I don't really care what the big idea is. I just care about the units that are potentially shippable. So I want to filter by clicking on each of these which ones are actually attached to maybe our next release version. Um, in this particular instance, we do actually have an active development sprint going. I can close that out if I'd like. But here, we have this associated with version 2. Again, we'd go ahead and groom the backlog, make sure that we understand what's top priority versus um, bottom priority, create a sprint of things that we're going to go through our release process in, um, move those across our our board in our work mode um, and then report on what was successful or not successful from a did everything go okay when we release these items, right? So did they actually release cleanly and are they in production? So again, from a release management standpoint, you can wrap the Scrum framework around your release management process and then use the uh, JIRA Agile tool to be able to uh, manage those pieces of work for you. So you've got a lot of possibilities and a lot of flexibility if you just think outside the box a little bit. So Shayla, um, to a certain extent that, that concludes my demonstration. Do you think it's time that we open it up to the floor a little bit and get some questions? Yeah, absolutely. We actually already have a couple of questions queued up. Um, so the first one I can actually answer. Um, I was asking about the uh, recorded versions for the, other, the earlier webinars that you mentioned. All of our recordings are, can be found on our website, precipio.com. Up to the top right of the page, there is a tab that says webinars. If you click on it, um, you'll see all of our webinars over the last couple of years. Um, so the next question is from Tom. And it says, please expand on Agile frameworks and how they're applicable to all business processes. Is this saying that Scrum is universally, universally applicable regardless of domain? I truly believe that Scrum is universally applicable, right? Because the, the basics of a framework are the fact that you have a triumvirate of roles, you have a, a team that makes a commitment and honors the commitment. You talk about short development cycles or short iterations. We won't even call them development cycles. Um, your short uh, iterations that you make a commitment to is, to is to say, I will have this done at the end of this time. 
from you and your team. You have your product owner that talks to your stakeholders, basically your, your no man slash yes man, and then you have somebody that facilitates the conversations and helps remove the blockers. I truly believe that the Agile frameworks, both Scrum and Kanban, are universally applicable. Um, they're applicable, applicable to any business process that has something, has to meet a commitment in a, in a particular time box and makes that makes and meets that commitment. All right, great, thanks. Um, so the next one says, how do you report estimated time to complete with story points? So the two are actually mutually exclusive in, in the Agile tool itself, right? Um, so you can either estimate in story points or you can estimate in hours, not really merging both of them. Now there is, what you can do is you can set up sort of you end up running it in two boards is really what happens, right? And so, for example, this one, this release management board, um, if I go back and actually filter this based on epics. Oh, issues, there we go. <laughs> um, in this particular instance, this one's based on story points, so I can look at this particular board as story points, right? Um, if I go back and I create the same board, release management board, maybe with an hours designation on the outside of it, and then I configure it to read and time track in hours under the configuration menu, then I can look at them side by side and kind of get a big idea of story points of 13 equals five development hours or something. I can get a vague idea. But within a single board, it's not possible. That's typically where we, we start referring people over to some of the other add-ons like Tempo, uh, Tempo Planner, um, to work in concurrence with this. So you can manage it in two separate boards as long as you have both estimates in the issue, both story points and hours. Okay, great, thanks. Um, let's see. Are you able to are you able to see how releases could change if we move stories around in the backlog or add more to the backlog? Right. So um, typically, the way that in this particular instance, we'll just go into the work board. Okay. So because of the way that Jira handles releases, is it that it handles it through versioning? Boards handle the same thing. Right. Um, at any given time, if I click release, this will tell me which issues are being released at any given time. Right. So, based on the version name, so we'll call this version one. I click release, and all 20 of these issues are tagged with a fixed version of version one and I'm ready to go. Now, at some point in time, as we're moving things across into this, this done column, that's what it's reading from in order to do a release, right? Um, so from a release perspective, if I start moving stuff in and saying, hey, ooh, yeah, now we're getting ready to do all these. Oops, I canceled that one because that was a, a subtask. Same thing, we go ahead and release these. We release them on version one. And what will happen is that at any given time, in any of my other issues in JIRA, if I tag it with this version name, it will automatically scope those into that release. Uh, so it is one of those things that you have to be cognizant of, that once you've done a release, you should actually archive that version so that it's not available to be picked any place else in JIRA. Yeah, so again, it's, it's, it's all dependent on what's in this done column and what you're releasing here. So can you see a version or a release change at any given time? Absolutely. You've got, your, you've got how many things are going in here, and when you click this release button, how many issues you have associated with it. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I think that's it for the questions. Um, I want to thank everyone for their time, for joining us on our webinar. Again, our next webinar is going to be on July 2nd at 11 a.m. Central, and it's going to be featuring um, 
a new new offering from Atlassian um, for enterprise clients. Um, we're not allowed to release any details on it yet, but in the ne next couple of weeks, I think we'll be able to give you more information. Um, we hope you found it informative and useful, and thanks again.